Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for another day to open up your word. We pray now that you'd use Pastor Izzy to speak to each one of us, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to fill us to overflowing. And Lord, just like that breeze is blowing off the ocean now, Mm -hmm. we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to encourage us, Lord. We just pray for extra special blessing, Lord, as the baptism to follow today. Lord, and we just ask for your power in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, one of my favorite chapters of things about the Spirit of God, um, the gifts specifically, because it starts off in verse 1, it says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly what? Spiritual gifts. We're supposed to desire earnestly. That means um, just a little, right? What, What does it mean when you earnestly desire something? That's a lot, right? I mean, that's earnest desire is the um, best way I can explain to the younger generations when the guy really likes the girl and he really, really pursues her and really wants to be with her. That's what we would call earnest desire. You know, that's the, the really, you know, wanting it bad. Well, that's what we're supposed to, to have that same emotion toward the spiritual gifts of God. You know, there's gifts of the Holy Spirit we've been studying about, but some people go, eh, well, so what? Like, it, no big deal. Just some present from God. Let me ask you, a present from God, how does this sound to you? Anybody here think a present from God would be good? You know, like, does he know how to give out good presents? This is, this is the part where sometimes Christianity really sells short the goodness of God. Because God has given us, in, in Luke's gospel, it says, the good gift. If you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, Jesus said, how much more your heavenly father will give the gift of his Holy Spirit to you? That's a gift. A gift of God's Spirit is wonderful. His Spirit, it says, leads us, guides us, comforts us, teaches us, brings to our remembrance all the things that the Lord has ever spoken to your heart, God's Spirit brings those things back when you need them. I mean, there's some days, I don't know about you, but maybe your faith meter is like kind of on the low end, you know, hitting like the ones and twos or maybe zero. Some of you going minus one. When, when you're having a bad faith day, it's really nice to have the gift of the Holy Ghost to be there to, to just remind you of the things that God has spoken to your heart before. And when, when, when it comes to the things of the Spirit, we don't really have a culture that has been, how do you say, stirred in a long time to like a, a, a real earnest desire where you go to a church and people are going, man, I want God's gifts. That's all I, you know. Can you imagine if you went from church to church and you were just a person going to visit churches and you saw all the people at those churches earnestly wanting God's gift of his spirit. Whatever his spirit wanted to give them, they were, God, give it to us. And they were excited about it. You know, something like, well, they're not too excited about Jesus over there. Or those ones, those are the frozen chosen. You know, I went to that church, they're like all dead. They just sit there, "Mm mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's, it's true. I mean, there are some Honestly, there are some expressions of Christianity that are so dull, I go to sleep. You know, I don't even want to say I'm part of the group because they look like they're... I, I know people go to a football game way more excited about their, their team. They'll even cheer, and it's not their team. More than the Christians cheer for their team. I mean, we have the Lord. We have the God Almighty, who we know, if you read to the end of the book, is going to win against Satan and all of, the, all of the fallen angels that are trying to bring their assault against the kingdom of God, they lose. You guys read that, right, at the end of the book? Who wins? That was one of the things when I was a young, young boy studying catechism. You know, I was l- training to be an altar boy. And, and basically, you know, the nuns 
we, I went to a church called St. Teresa's in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and the nuns I had asked, what, could you tell me what the book of Revelation is about? And I had this sweet nun, she was like, um, and I, 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 by the way, I was about third grade, just so you know, like, uh, could you tell me what the, what this book of Revelation is, the, the last one, I don't get it, like, there's like, like there's like weird things and fightings and there's like these bowls of wrath and there's this and there and I, I you know as a youngster reading I was like I'm confused and the nun was so sweet she says um, let me pray about it and and let me read some do some stu study tonight and I I'll, I'll tell you tomorrow if I if I have an answer I said okay I'm thinking go God tell her because. I don't get nothing. And she comes the next day, and, and it was so sweet. You know, she, she goes, okay, to sum up, like in the movie, you know, to sum up, it's a battle between the good and the evil, between God's side and the devil's side. And in the end, God wins and the devil loses. That's the book of Revelation. I was like, you know, ever... Honestly, those of you who have studied the book of Revelation, tell me, is that a good sum up? Yeah. That's it, man. She nailed it. 100%. You can read. I know I've taught every chapter, every verse of the book of Revelation multiple times since then. And you know what? That's the best sum up. Is in the end, God wins, the devil loses, and all those that are with God, well, they get to have a party. I mean, this is the part... She didn't elaborate on, but literally when you read the book of Revelation, all of us, that, that Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Come here. Come into my rest, into my key. Ha, ha, do any of you look forward to hearing those words from Jesus' lips for him to say to you, come here. Enter into my rest. What a day that's going to be. But see, sometimes people, they, I don't know why they're not excited about this. I mean, if you can cheer for your football team, you can certainly cheer for God's team that he's going to win. And you can cheer that, that he's, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Until this day comes, God says, don't worry. Jesus, the disciples, they were all bummed out in John chapter 14. They were, he was talking about his departure and they were like, oh no, he's going to go. Who's going to feed us free lunch? And... The, they didn't say that. I'm saying they thought that. Cause. And Jesus says, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because when I go away, I will send a what? A helper. And who's the helper that he said he would send? The Holy Spirit. And he'll be with you. He'll never leave you. The, you know, the nice thing about the Holy Spirit is when you have that touch of God's spirit in your heart, it, it takes away loneliness. You don't feel lonely anymore because you know that God is with you. Like the psalmist wrote in the Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art, what? With me. Isn't it a nice feeling to know the Lord is with you? You know, in these days, there's, there are things that we're going to face, and if, if you don't have that comfort in your soul, I mean down in your spirit where you know God is with you, it can get you kind of uneasy. There's an emptiness in you because, you. by the way, you were created by God for a complement to your being. It's like you have a hole in, inside you that only He can fulfill. Only he fits in. I know people feel that emptiness. They're like, I feel a hole in me. I just, they, they, they try to stick different, it's like sticking puzzle pieces in that don't fit, you know. They stick the bottle in and that, that you know, they try alcohol or drugs or they try to fill this hole and it's not the right shape. It doesn't fit. It doesn't connect in. It doesn't like snap in like the right shape piece that, but the Holy Spirit, that's the piece that fits in us that we need. We need his spirit. And Paul, he's writing to the church of Corinth. Now these guys, if you haven't picked up on it yet, these guys, they weren't perfect. 
They were doing some sinning things and they were messing up. But today we're going to see they were excited. They were excited about the gifts of the Spirit. They thought this is cool. And, I, and you know, if we were to go to that church today, I wonder what we would categorize them as, you know. Because when you read about the, the things Paul has to address in this chapter, some of you have read ahead, you know chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Did they seem like the type of church that would be the frozen chosen when you got there? Or would they be the like Pentecostal ones, speaking in tongues and, 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 and what? On fire, right? They'd be the on fire, you know, ones. And not that they were perfect or anything, but they were, they were full of that fire of the Spirit. They had that fire. And Paul's got to address some, <laughs> some um, use of the fire when it comes to gathering in um, a congregational assembly. Like when you come together as a church, you know, and you all have the fire, we don't want to freak everyone out that shows up. If you're all, you know, dancing around with the fire, they might think you're a bunch of crazies. So Paul is going to, Paul's going to do this in a way that, I mean, I'm, this is one of the first passages of scripture I learned in the early days. Uh, I got saved in a little church in northern Arizona called Calvary Chapel, Verde Valley. And this is a hick church. I mean, when I say hick, Every worship song was country. Doesn't matter if it was written another style. It's country. Because that's the only style the worship leader knew. And there are only three chords. It was all changed to just three chord songs in a nice country twang. We're all going to worship the Lord now. Praise the Lord. And it just, you know, okay. But there was a fire. Of God's Spirit. It was in the in the late seventies when there was this Jesus People movement going on in our, in, in our nation, and it seemed like everywhere you went, coffee house, whatever, there was people talking about Jesus. Standing in the line at the bank, people talking about Jesus, which is like just this this move of God's Spirit, and the church there was excited about the gifts, and the pastor actually had to teach this chapter to his church. Almost like it was the church at Corinth. Okay, just to give you the setting. We were the crazy ones all excited about the Lord. And he had to go over some of the um, how to use the fire inside the house. You know, like when you're cooking in a house, how you don't want to burn it down. You want to keep it on the stove and keep it simmering the pan and use it for what it's made for. Fire is good when used properly. can make some beautiful meals out of that, but you got to do it right. So Paul, these are the words. Let's look at what he says to this zealous on fire church. He says, pursue love. Now we went over love last week. The greatest thing is love. Abide in faith, hope, and love. We ended last week. And the greatest was love. So he says, pursue love. Pursue it. Make it a pursuit of yours. As, you're, as, as you are a Christian in your Christian pursuits, Love should be that first thing that you're aiming for. And then he says, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. But especially, especially one gift. One gift that is not really heralded in the American Christian church like it was in the early church. And what gift is that? That you speak in tongues? No, that you, you said it, that you prophesy. Now what, it, let me just show you what happens. He says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. The one who prophesies, however, he speaks to men for men's edification, for building up men, and exhortation, and consolation, you know, to console someone. Isn't it neat the gift of prophecy can console someone? You know, when do you need consolation? But th give me an example. For the kids might go, I don't know what consolation is. What, what is it to console someone? someone? Someone in their family died. And you're, and you're saying, look, don't worry. The Lord's going to be with you. The Lord knows where they're at. You know, the words that comfort and console a person, those are words that are spoken by the gift of prophecy in the Spirit. That's a gift. And a and prophet... Well, we've gone over this before. He only speaks the things what 
not what he thinks. What's a prophet's lead off? Thus saith the who? The Lord. The Lord has these words to comfort you. The Lord wants you to know these things. Now Paul says, these guys were speaking in tongues. Multiple languages. Now, we went over last week, if you speak with the tongues of men or the tongues of angels, he says, but you don't have love. What were you, a noisy what? Gong? A clanging symbol? You're a noisemaker. If you speak, you can speak a bunch of languages, but if you don't have love, you're just, a, you're just making noise. But is the gift of tongues a, a legitimate gift? Is it a real thing that God gives a gift to speak another language without even studying? I mean, I'm, you talk about cheating for those of you that took language in school. I, I started off speaking Italian and then I learned English when I went fourth grade, uh, four, sorry, fourth grade, four years old, went to kindergarten. And I got a really fast intro to English when I needed to go shishi. Pee-pee in Italian. I was like doing the pee-pee dance at four and I raised my hand and I politely asked if I could go to the bathroom. But I asked in Italian because that's the only language I knew. And the teacher looked at me like a, a deer in headlight look. You know, like, what's wrong with this kid? And she didn't answer me. And she kept on doing her class, and some other kid raised their hand, and they said, you know, I don't remember all the words. All I heard was bathroom in the sentence. And the teacher nodded yes and pointed to the corner, and there was a door in the kindergarten room right in the very back corner, and that was the bathroom. The potty was right there. And the kid got up and went to the bathroom. You know how fast you pick up English when you <laughs> are four? And you need to do the next visit. You're like holding it. Bathroom. Bathroom. And she went, okay. And I, and I was the next one in line. And, and when I got done with school that day, the teacher looked at my mom and said, you need to teach him English. And, uh, and I was like, I figured out one word already. Bathroom. <laughs> Good start. You know, my kids don't, they, they didn't ever, like, growing up, we, we, were, we, we carpooled with one of the girls from, one of the Japanese girls, and I, um, I would always say to her, well, teach me something in Japanese on the way to school, and she'd be like, oh, okay, he's kind of weird, he's learning all these things, and, and she's like, what do you want to learn? I said, well, um, how do you ask for a glass of water? How do you ask where the bathroom is? She's like, huh? I said, listen, trust me on this. If you ever travel the world, you need to start with a few lines. You know, like, could I have a glass of water? Where's the bathroom? This is, these are mandatory, okay? This is not like suggested list of learning. You should learn all of these in multiple languages in case you do travel. You know, one of the things you want to pick up right away on is how to ask for where the restroom is. Not everyone speaks English. Just like that lady didn't speak Italian. And... The gift of tongues is a, a God-given gift to speak a language, but it's cheating. You don't have to study. You don't have to go to school and take courses and practice. and do all, all of a sudden, God just gives a gift and you can speak the language fluently. Now, anyone up for having that gift without even, I mean, no study required. You get a free language, just get God-gifted. I, I tell you this because... This was the first gift, the first manifestation of God's Spirit that we see in the book of Acts. And it's, it's one that gets taught a lot as, to Christians in America as this is the evidence that you have the gift of God's Spirit. But, you know, Paul went, already discussed this. What if you have the gift of prophecy but you don't speak in tongues? Do you have God's Spirit? The answer is, of course you do. Or what if you have the gift of healing but you don't speak in tongues? Does that person have God's Spirit? Sure. They're, God gives differing gifts, as He wills, not as we want. And if you ever run into some dogmatic group that says, you must speak in tongues to prove that you have the Spirit, and you're going, but what if I prophesy? I, I find that a lot of those groups don't know chapter 14 of Corinthians. They don't know 1 Corinthians 14 that says, 
the greatest of the gifts is not tongues. The greatest, let me show you. Verse 4, the one who speaks in a tongue, he edifies himself. He builds up himself. But the one who prophesies, he builds up what? The church. Now, Paul says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. But even more, I wish that you would all what? Prophesy. Wouldn't it be nice if all of us had the gift of prophecy? You're like struggling. I wish I knew what God wanted me to do. Diana shows up. Thus saith the Lord. He wants you to do this. Just comes right out of her. Poof. You're like, thank you, Lord. I needed that. Convenient to have people gifted with the gift of prophecy. I told you last week. It's like It'd be like having your best friend have that gift. It's like pocket prophet, man. I got him with me. He's my best buddy. Don't know what to do. Lord, tell me. And then all of a sudden your friend goes, Thus saith the Lord. You know, that's a great gift to have around. Now Paul says, I wish, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. But even more, I wish that you all would prophesy. And greater, let me just put, show you this verse. You might want to highlight verse 5 in the middle here. Greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues. I know that if you come from a Pentecostal upbringing in a, maybe the Midwest of our country where they emphasized only the gift of tongues, there's some groups. Um, I, I, I was exposed to a group called the Assembly of God Church in our area, and they were dogmatic that you had to speak in tongues, but they didn't ever talk about prophecy. And I was like, excuse me, it says right here, which one is greater, speaking in tongues or prophesying? Prophesying. I mean, this is in the Bible. You don't have to like go grasping for weird straws here. This is right here in the instruction book. You know, that's what the kids tell me. Bible, B-I-B-L-E. Basic instruction before leaving earth. That's B-I-B-L. That's acronym for Bible. This is the instructions right here. And this instruction tells me that the gift of prophecy is greater than the gift of tongues. And then the one that prophesies Unless the tongue is interpreted, he says, so that the church could receive edifying. If someone interprets the tongue for everyone to understand what they said, then great. But Paul goes on and he says, Now, it, brethren, if I come to you speaking in a tongue, what will it profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even a lifeless thing, he says, either a flute or a harp, in producing a sound, if they don't produce a distinction in their tones, how will, how will you know what was played on the flute or on the harp? You know, it's got to have a clarity of tones so that you recognize, oh, I know that tune. I, I'm familiar with, that, with, with that, that particular song. He says, if a bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you buy a tongue produce utter speech that is clear, how will, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be just speaking into the air. Now, have any of you witnessed Christian groups where they're, they're speaking in kind of indistinct languages and they're kind of muttering and, and they're all doing that at once and they're all praying, they call it praying in tongues and, and as a group doing it. And you can't really pick out one person what they're saying and it just kind of sounds like like a little bit of a... I don't know. To me, it's a disorganized noise. It's not really in concert. I, I've been in a group where this took place. I actually st stood up and said, excuse me. My first experience with this was in, um, well, our little Calvary Chapel in Verde Valley. And the pastor actually went to this passage. This is where I learned this. Let me show you. He, the pastor, in our little church, someone started speaking out in tongues in Verde Valley. And, and he, he went to this this 1 Corinthians 14, and he said, guys, if you, um, if you to speak in a tongue, it says you're only supposed to do it, well, here, here's the guidelines. Let me read the, the rest of this par portion to you. He said, there are perhaps, verse 10, many kinds of languages in the world. No kind is without meaning, he said. But if I then don't know the meaning of that language, I will be to the one that is speaking a, a barbarian, a foreigner. I know barbar bar is from the Greek. Barbar bar means um, barbar bar bar bar. bar. You think I'm joking? This is not for. 
You you think The Simpsons made it? Mar, 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 mar. No. Bar bar in Greek is the sound what the Greeks would make when someone came from a foreign language, uh, a foreign country, and didn't speak Greek. They called them like noisemakers. Bar 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 bar. Their, their language sounds like. Mar, 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 mar. I don't understand a thing they're saying. That's why they call them barbarians. That's where the root of this word comes from. And the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me if I don't know their language. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, they were zealous, he said, seek to, to what? To abound for the edification, the building up of the church. Therefore, let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For, for if I pray in a tongue, Paul says, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What then is the outcome? He said, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how does the one who fills the place of the ungifted say, say the am amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't even know what you're saying? If he doesn't understand what you're saying, I don't care how fluent it is in another language. I, listen, just for fun, you know, one time with my youth group, I started teaching in Italian. No big deal to me. I knew everything I was saying. You should see the looks I got, though. Like, what's wrong with Izzy today? You know, because someone switches channel. He's, like, stuck in the wrong language. And they didn't get it. I know the deer in headlight look. I seen it with that teacher when I asked to go to the bathroom. <laughs> when they don't know what you're saying, doesn't matter how eloquent you are. They just don't know. Paul says, if I pray and, and they can't tell that I'm giving praise to God, what use is it? They just don't know. He says, for you're giving thanks well enough, verse 17, but the other person's not built up. They're not edified. Paul says, now I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. However, in the church, he says, I would desire to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Here's the heart of the pastor, Paul. I'd rather tell you five words with my mind that I know you can, I'll have to use English for you today. Jesus loves you very much. Ta-da! He said, I'd rather tell you that than a thousand words in another language. Because if you don't understand the language, you don't get anything out of it. And the gift of tongues that he's talking about, now there is differing gifts. That, remember back in the chapter right before this, he said, if I speak with the tongues of men, or the tongues of what was that other one? Angels. He said, if I speak with the tongues of men or the tongues of angels, he says, but I don't have love. I'm nothing. It doesn't matter what language it's in. Love is king. People can tell when you speak with love. You can have all the right words and not have love. And it doesn't matter. God loves you. <laughs> jerk. I mean. Or God loves you, jerk. You can say the same words. Isn't it interesting, just the, the spirit behind the words? Good thing God loves you. Or it's a good thing God loves you, isn't it? We just say the same words, but the spirit of how you speak. And you know, as a public speaker, it pains me that there's these guys, these professionals that study communication. You can even get degrees in communication. They're very depressing. I took a bunch of communication courses when I was in college. You know what depressed me? They say 95% of all things communicated have nothing to do with the words we choose. It's not the choice of eloquent linguistics that will impress into the people's minds. Instead, they say 95% of what's communicated comes through by what? The nonverbal 
the things what your countenance says, the way your being is presenting, that's what people read. They can tell. When you love them, they know. When you don't, say all you want, but what do you say? Tongues of men, tongues of angels, no love, it's profits how much? Zero. It does you no good to try to speak. And some of you've got something on your heart you really want to tell someone. You want them to know something, but maybe inside you're, you're frustrated with them, so you yell it at them. How good does that get the message across? How, I mean, for those of you who lived a little while, is this an effective tool? Just shoot yourself in the foot, you'll feel better. It doesn't work. Try love. Love is what's important. That's what Paul says. I'd rather tell you five words. Jesus loves you very much. Jesus died for all sins. Not some, not a few, all. If you believe in Jesus, you shall be what? Saved. Now, the gift of tongues, though it has been abused in some Christian circles, it has been misused. They didn't read 1 Corinthians 14. Because it goes on and gives a few more. Oh, I forgot. I didn't get to the part, did I? About how we're supposed to do this. To operate in this gift. He says, brethren, verse 20, don't be children in your thinking. He says, yet in evil be infants. But in your thinking be mature. When it comes to evil, you don't need to study evil. The, the Bible says, be simple concerning evil, wise concerning good. This is the Proverbs says. We don't need to know evil. We need to know good. In the law it's written, by men of strange tongues, by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen, says the Lord. Poor, poor Isaiah. That's Isaiah 28, 11. The Lord says, I'm going to speak to them. By men of strange tongues, the lips of strangers, I will speak to my people. Do they listen? No. So then tongues, Paul says, are a sign, not for those who believe, but they are a sign to the unbeliever. But prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers. Prophecy is a sign to the believers. This is why when we come together as a church, we need the gift of prophecy. We already got the believers gathering in his name. We need the encouragement, those signs that, that speak to us. Now, therefore, if a whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and the ungifted men, can you imagine we're all speaking in different languages? And the ungifted person, they don't have the spirit, they enter. Paul says, will they not look at you and say you are all mad? They're crazy. That's what, that's, by the way, if you've gone to some Pentecostal meetings, you're like, they're cuckoo. They sure look cuckoo. But he says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever enters or the ungifted man enters, it says he is convicted by all. For he is called into account by all. And the secrets of his heart are disclosed. So he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly amongst you. What then is the outcome, brethren, when you assemble? Each one of you has a psalm. You have a teaching, a revelation. You have a tongue. You have an interpretation. Paul says, let all things be done for edification. And if anyone speaks in a tongue, Paul's, here's, the, here's the guidelines. They should speak by two or at most three. And each one in turn, in other words, take turns, not talk over each other at the same time. And, and, and then there must be one that interprets. But if there is no interpreter, he must be kept silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. You know, if there's no one to interpret and you have the gift of tongues, it doesn't mean you don't get to use your gift. It just means you don't get to say it, you know, out loud to the whole church. What if you have an interpreter? Are tongues... I mean, what, when was tongues first used? Do you guys remember in the book of Acts? Pentecost. Yeah, that's right. Turn, turn with me to Acts, the beginning of the book of Acts. We, we read this in chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost, this is verse 1 of Acts 2, had come, they were all together in one place. Now Jesus had said, Go wait in the upper room until you are clothed with power, endued, with power, another translator, King James says, with power to be my witnesses. 
They needed God's spirit to give them the power. They were, they were actually scared, if you remember reading. After Jesus died and rose again, they were cowering. They were hiding. Jesus says, you go wait in Jerusalem till, till the Holy Spirit gives you power to be my witnesses. And then, I love this. You guys are probably familiar with this chapter. Suddenly, there came a noise from, from where? From heaven. Now, listen, pay can, careful attention to the details of this story. You might like this. A noise like a violent rushing wind. Does it say there came a violent rushing wind into the upper room? No, just the noise of a violent rushing wind. What noise does a violent rushing wind make? <sighs> no. <sighs> My mic won't even do it good. It comes out so loud when there's a violent rushing wind. And to let you know how loud it is, um, if you look ahead at verse 6, when the sound occurred, the crowds came together. And they were bewildered, saying, what, what's going on? I mean, what's this, this noise? But see, when the noise came, something else came. You guys know what came, right? The Holy Spirit. And the gift, the first gift given to, the, to these early believers is found right here. It was called the gift of tongues. Now, I like this particular style of the gift of tongues because this is one of the first um, examples that I was taught about the gift of tongues uh, from a... I, I was taught about a, a, a missionary that in the days when planes were in their early, early, early days of flight... There was a missionary who had a heart to go to Africa. I can't remember the fellow's name. Sorry, I wrote it in my other Bible. I don't have it in this. I sh should have transferred my notes. But this missionary, back in the in the early days of, of this past century of our country, when the when the Fl Wright brothers had just got planes flying, they were real crude. He was like, "Well, I heard of this headhunter tribe in Africa that's never heard of Jesus, and." How will they hear, it says, unless there's a preacher? I'm going to go there and I'm going to, I'm going to share the gospel, even if they kill me and eat me. Oh, yeah, I forgot. They, 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 yeah, they ate people. So this guy got what we would call a crude parachute. You know, not the ones they steer today and fly in. We're talking one of the, like, little round things that just make you slow your fall to the earth, like open an umbrella and jump kind of thing, you know. This guy got one of those. And the pilot told him, you know, where I'm taking you, there's some, there's no place to land. You know, we're going to, You are you sure these people, they eat people? This is a really bad idea. And the pilot's like, I don't want to do this because I'm, I'm dooming you to your death. And he's like, no, I'll be okay. God told me to go. And this fellow put on one of the parachutes and jumped out of one of those like early Wright Brother type planes out of the two-seater, jumped out and parachuted down into this African village where it was known for eating people. And, and <laughs> he goes down there and he's raised in a, oh, I forgot to tell you, in a Baptist upbringing. They didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Ghost in his church. They, they believed that the gifts of the Holy Ghost were, they were real. That he, they did not believe that they didn't happen back in the Bible days. They just didn't believe that they are still around for today. And so this fellow jumps out of the plane for this parachute. And he comes down in the middle of this field, and there's all these fellows that, they see him coming from the sky. They surround him with spears. And he falls on his face. And he's thinking, I'm a goner. And he's pulling his parachute in, just thinking, like, I want to cover up with him. But he starts praying fervently. And he's praying, and he's pulling his chute and, like, kind of gathering, like, a little pillow under his head, thinking they're going to cut my head off. I'll just, you know, catch my head in this parachute or something. I don't know what he was thinking. He's, cra he's crazy for doing it, personally. But he starts praying, and after a while, Nobody's cut his head off. Nobody's poked him with those spears yet. And he looks up, and they're all laying on their faces with their hands down, and they're all praying. And he's trying to figure out what's going on. Well, he had read this part I'm telling you about in Acts, 
what it says. Well, let me tell you what happens with the noise, and then I'll tell you what happened to him. It says the noise of the rushing wind came, and it filled the whole house. And they were all sitting there, and then there appeared tongues of fire that distributed themselves and rested on each one of the disciples. Can you just picture this? Mighty rushing wind sound, and then tongues of fire. I, w I wonder what they look like. You know, I mean, we could probably get Steven Spielberg to do nice graphics, you know, with the tongue of fire, and comes and it rests on each one of them. And but when it did, listen to this. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. Now listen, I know the tongues that they're talking about are not the tongues of angels. You know how I know? I, I cheated. I read ahead. Let me show you. Now in those days there were in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together because they were bewildered. And each one of them was hearing the, them speak in their own language. And they were amazed. They were astonishing. W why are not all of these men that are speaking, aren't these guys all Galileans? How is it that each one of them is, is speaking in our own language to which we were born? There, there's Here, listen. There's Parthenians, Medes, Elamites. Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, districts of Libya around all the way to Cyrene, visitors all the way from Rome. Guys, I don't know if you know, you know, the Middle Eastern Mediterranean region, but Rome. This is like, if, if you're going to boat ride it, it's like 1,500 well, 1,200 if you had a direct route, but they didn't actually sail directly. They kind of went from harbor to harbor, port to port, uh, over to Crete, down, you know, 1,300, 1,500 miles sailing. If you did it by foot, you're talking a couple thousand miles of trekking to get to Jerusalem. And the people, they're going, listen, we're from Rome. Now, if you're from Rome, what language are you speaking? happen to know this one Italian they're there listening to these guys these disciples that are Galileans and one of them's got to be speaking Italian I would have probably gone to him you know just to catch the gospel message and I know what the topic was because I read ahead too it says they it well also there was Jews proselytes Cretans Arabs so you had Arabic also and each one of us hears them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God verse 11 says though they were speaking in different languages each one of them was telling of the mighty deeds of God how great is God and they were they were continued in amazement it says great perplexity saying to one another what does this mean but others were mocking them saying they are full of sweet wine that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of how many people you know drink and can speak fluently uh, Italian or Arabic or Crete or Latin? It, yeah, it just pops out, right? No, they, they, they speak babble, slur their words, you know. It, there's no language improvement from drinking. But this is what they, they actually insulted them. They must be drunk. Yeah, give me some of that wine. Drink of the Spirit and you can speak a language fluently and praise God. That's the kind of, now see, some people say, why are you so into the Holy Ghost? I said, because you can get a better high from the Holy Ghost than no hangover. <laughs> Not only that, you can speak other languages. Peter stood up and said, with the eleven, he, he raised his voice, said, men of Judea, all of you that live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. For it's only the third hour of the day, it's nine in the morning. They started the first hour at 6 a.m. It's 9 in the morning, and this is just what was spoken through the prophet Joel. It shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will pour 
in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. Is this just for men? What's it say? Men and women. The gift of prophecy. And, you know, there was prophetesses in the Old Testament too. They're prophets and prophetesses. They're, they're both. This is, God's spirit is, is given to both sexes. He says, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth be, below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be on that, that, that it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Now men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, the man attested to you by God, with miracles, with wonders, signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You guys nailed him to a cross by hands of godless men, and you put him to death. But Peter says, but God raised him up again, put him in agony to death, since it is impossible for, for him to be held in its power. Death could not hold Jesus. And Peter goes on and proclaims to them the words from the Psalms that God wasn't going to allow Jesus to undergo decay and that he was the one that God spoke of. And when they hear this, I'll skip ahead to verse 37. You can read the whole chapter for extra credit later. He says, when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart. And they said, brethren, what, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Each one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, just for them, right? I don't know why these guys who say the Holy Spirit was for those guys back then, but not for now. Because what does it say in verse 39? You might want to highlight this one. This is where it ties into the fellow that parachuted in. Let me show you. The promise is for you and for your children and for who are all for who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. Those who are far off, who is he talking about? Us. Even that missionary in the last century that parachuted in. The gift of the Spirit was for him too. He parachuted in, by the way. He got on the ground. He's gathering up his chute and he's praying fervently. He won't look up. He, he finally looks up and they're all bowed down with their spears laying down and they're all look like they're worshiping. And he's like, what? What's going on? And he didn't know that he was just, he was praying, just fervently praying. What he came to find out it wasn't going to happen right away. He found out that one of the people in their group started to pray, and when that guy prayed, he prayed in English. So he's like, you speak English. The guy looked at him, I don't know what you're saying. So he began to pray, and he started hearing words coming out of his mouth, but they didn't sound like the words that he knew. And the guy that was, the whole group was listening to him. Well, it came about after a little bit of time of being with him, he found out that when he landed, he was actually praying in their dialect. He was so fervent and so worried about getting his head cut off, he was just sitting there praying. And he's a Baptist that didn't believe in the gift of tongues. Go tell God it doesn't work anyway, right? I mean, the giver of gifts doesn't care. When you say, I'll go, I mean, this guy, you think about his heart. I'll go to a to a tribe that is known for eating people just so I can share Jesus, but I don't know their language. And I'm going on a one-way ticket. They're parachuting me in, and there's no roads out, and I'm going to just be stuck there. That guy was used to create, I mean, there was a huge revival that broke out because of that man. But that man got introduced to verse 39, that the promise is for you, your children, and all who are afar off even Baptists who do not believe in the gift of tongues for today. But God didn't care because that guy needed the gift. You know, when you're the giver of all good gifts and someone's in trouble and you're good like God is good, does he go, oh, I'm not giving out that gift? No. He's not. He, 
God is not stingy about his gifts. You know, I told you, my first experience with this chapter was in northern Arizona. I go there, Little Hick Church, everybody's excited about the Lord. We're at a prayer meeting, and I got some really heavy things on my heart I want to talk to the Lord about. So I went to the prayer meeting. Now I'm a new Christian. I don't really know how prayer meetings work, you know, but I figure you go there, and the idea is it's called a prayer meeting, so what are you supposed to do? Pray, right? So we get together, and there's like, I don't know, 20 people at this house. It's a house, home church. They're having a home church, we're going to have prayer meeting. They go in the living room. Not a lot of room for 20 people, so I was small. I went under the coffee table. It, there was no other space, so I just slid under there. I'm like on my face praying to God, oh God, I need an answer about this thing. And I was really, really, you know, I figure I'm going to prayer meeting. This is where I get my answer. And so we're praying, and I'm waiting. Like, I don't know the rules of how you do prayer meetings or anything. I don't know if there's like etiquette or anything. So I'm just listening, kind of getting the flow of, well, the pastor started, and then this other elder, he prayed, and then this, you know, lady who's on the worship team, she prayed, and someone else prayed. You know, they're ta like taking turns. So I'm like, when's my chance? You know, I got a big prayer on my heart. I want to know this answer to this. God, I need to know the answer. And I, I haven't had a chance yet. And this one lady, she starts praying, oh God, you are so magnificent and so wonderful and your name is greatly to be praised, and it was really eloquent. Was, oh, by the way, she started praying in Italian. Just like, and I'm listening to her praying. I'm like, this is a great Lord. When do I get my turn? You know, and the pastor, Pastor Ken Brewer, he stops. Everybody stop. Bible says whenever someone prays in a tongue that, you know, you're supposed to do it in turn, one or two at a time. And he turned to 1 Corinthians 14. He did the whole thing, you know. And, you, and you're to pray and then have one interpret the prayer. And if there's no interpreter, then it's great that you can speak in another language. He didn't even know what language he was speaking. He was like, whatever language you're speaking, you know, that's great and everything. But, you know, we don't know that language. So does anyone have an interpretation of what she said? And one of the cowboy guys goes, I think it's really weird, but when she was praying, I think I heard what she was saying. He goes, oh, maybe you have the gift of interpretation. What did you hear? And he, in a nice country twang, she said that God is great and magnificent and worthy to be praised and did this and, and, and sent his son and, did, you know, and, and I'm like, yeah, 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 that's what she said, you know, like, come on, when are we going to get back to prayer? I got a big prayer here. And they're stopping the whole meeting over this lady praying in a time. What's the big deal? This is what I'm thinking. Now, I don't know that this is her. This is the first time this girl ever prayed in Italian. She had never. So, so the pastor goes, well, does anyone else have that give a, like confirmation that that's what she said? Because the guy was saying, I think she said. And finally, I'm under the coffee table. I'm like, yes, that's what she said. Can we go back to prayer? And the guy, the pastor's like, <clears throat> do you, how do you know? Do you have the gift of interpretation? I said, I don't know about that. <laughs> but I know what she said. Well, how do you know what she said? Now, he doesn't know that I speak Italian for my first language, so... I might because she spoke in Italian. And and you know Italian? I said, Yes, I know Italian. It's my first language. So she's like, I spoke in Italian? Wow! Praise the Lord! I got to speak in the Wow, this is the greatest day. This is the best prayer meeting ever. She's flipping out. The other guy goes, I got to interpret Italian. This is wonderful. And I'm like, can we go back to prayer? I'm under the coffee table. Can we please pray? I still haven't got my answer yet. I'm so new at this Jesus stuff that I'm like, afterwards I come up from behind her and I greet her in Italian. Just to see, you know, because if they know Italian and you greet a certain way, they're going to turn and say something back to you. If they look at you like this, huh? You know, they don't really, she didn't know Italian. It was a gift of God's spirit. God showed me that that was a real gift. God can give someone a gift of of another language without ever stop. I had to do it the hard way. I had to go to school, learn the English. 
You know, the Italian was easy. I grew up doing that at home. But, you know, if you try picking up English for your second language, not so good. English is confusing. It has like weird words. They got, they got words that sound the same that are spelled different and mean different things. There's there, there, and there. The there that's over there that has here in it, but it's not here. It's there. And then there's they are, but there. And then there's there, like it's theirs. Like air, H-E-I-R, but T-H, right? The ear. The spelling things, too, are wrong. They pronounce all the vowels backwards to Italian. A sounds like E. Sounds like, I mean, they don't... In Italian, we use the vowel sounds different than they do in English. Kept saying to my daughter, Ti amo. So she kept writing to me, T-E-A-M-O. I said, honey, Ti amo is T-I. A-M-O. In Italian, T almost T I, but it's pronounced T. But it's pronounced or it's written like you would say T I. Well, it's confusing. But this lady was so excited. I spoke in Italian. God is real. His spirit's real. I got the gift of tongues. I was like, great for you. Good on. Can we get back to prayer? <laughs> Seriously. This didn't like float my boat yet because for me, it's just another language. But I do appreciate looking back that the pastor had the patience to say, hey, you know, not everyone understood this, so does anyone have an interpretation? And once you hear the interpretation, the interpretation was beautiful. I mean, God is great. Greatly to be praised. He's magnificent. I mean, the, the cowboy interpreted almost exactly the same exact words I would have chosen. But her prayer was more eloquent because it was in Italian. It's weird. In Italian, you can say some more really beautiful things about God that don't really, there's not the equivalent in English. And I like that about language. I like, I don't mind that at all. I mean, how much praise do you think God deserves? Oh, in every language we can praise God. I mean, and you can pick some really cool words in different languages for him that really express how great he is. But these guys, the gift of tongues in the first church, the day of Pentecost was a gift of speaking languages, not of t uh, tongues of angels, tongues of men. All different languages for all the people present. And you know, I found out the gift of tongues works really good as a witnessing tool. When you don't know what to say and you're talking, maybe you get thrown into a cross-cultural situation. This might be for some of our YWAMers that are going to go over to some foreign country and they don't know the language. Just ask God to give you the gift of tongues. Like he did for these guys. You might just stand up and be declaring his mighty deeds. Don't even know what you're saying. But don't worry, he's got it covered. He'll pick the perfect the perfect words to tell about his great deeds through his spirit. And it's a great witnessing tool. Powerful, powerful tool. I don't want to discount tongues. Tongues is great. But which gift is greater? Prophecy. Next week we're going to go over more details about prophesying in a group. How important is prophecy? How much do we need the gift of prophecy in the church today? And uh, oh, let me close this in prayer. Father, thanks for this passage of Scripture that gives us such sweet instructions, such wonderful hope and encouragement of the gifts of your Spirit. Lord, help us as we pursue love and we desire earnestly your spiritual gifts. Let those gifts be poured out even now on the youngsters that get baptized today and anyone else who would desire to, to join them. We ask it together now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.